everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to Get Hired in Tech and Healthcare. Today we're going to do a live technical interview. It's kind of the first of its kind. Um, I don't know anyone else that's done it, so we're pretty excited to kind of go through it. Uh, we have a lucky candidate, victim, student, <laughs> if you will, over here ready to go, uh, kind of how this came about. Uh, in the beginning of get hired, we asked what people wanted. Uh, my friend Jacob and I started the group a little over a year ago, and we started asking people, what would you like to see in a get hired you know, industry meetup? This is kind of the first of, of what we're doing. First it was guest speakers. Hey, let's learn about what a resume is. Let's really figure out and dig into what people are looking for. So we've done that over the course of the year. We've gained quite a bit of membership. We're almost at 700 and just over 15 months, so we're growing fairly rapidly. Um, as far as meetups concerned, we are the second largest in Southwest Washington and the fastest growing in the entire Portland, uh, Southwest region um, area. So we're growing fairly quickly. And so one of the reasons that we've had success is we've asked you guys, the members, what do you want to see? So at the end of last year, I started really put it pushing and asking, what do you want to see? What's important to you? Because this meetup is not about, you know, the organizers so much. It's about what do you want? What does the membership want to see? What's not out there? What can we do to provide value to you? So with that said, we brought in lots of guest speakers every two weeks and trying to bring, bring people in, one locally from the Portland, Vancouver area, and people that were hiring, people that were community involved, people that want to come in and help. I don't ever bring somebody in that won't answer you after the meetup. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, people that are accessible. So anyone that you see on the meetup page, they are accessible. They are somebody that you could reach out to say, hey, I'm part of Get Hired. Um, I've been with the meetup. Absolutely, you can reach out to them. Um, that is something I, I hold true that, that we want to bring in really powerful people. With that said, the next thing that we wanted to do, we asked and people told us, and members told us that, hey, we'd like to see some interactive stuff. We want to be a part of it, right? So the first interactive um, session we did, I did a live LinkedIn interview, uh, not interview, LinkedIn presentation. And so we had people bring in their laptops, their iPads, whatever, their devices, and we did, I showed you from a recruiter's per perspective, how that looks, what does it look like, why and how should you set up your LinkedIn in order to be found from recruiters uh, all over the industry. So then I thought, okay, we did this, what else can we do? And someone's like, what about interviews? And I was like, interviews, that'll work. Let's, let's, let's see if we can find somebody that's gonna sit in front of an entire crowd and conduct a first time real technical interview, whiteboard and all. And so, uh, that's where this kind of was born. I searched far and wide, and let me tell you, you tech folks are a little bit shy when it comes to camera and performing uh, <laughs> live. So I probably talked to 20-something people, and I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll, I'll attend. <laughs> I'll show up. And, and so uh, ran into Adam over here. Adam is a student at Washington State University, Vancouver, uh, studying... Um, he's going to be a CS major. He's been in tech for a while on the hardware side. So he is definitely somebody that um, has a technical background, but is getting into the programming side. So uh, I met with him, worked with him for a little bit, and I said, hey, uh, you want to do this thing we're doing? And he, he said yes. So um, I just want to say thanks to Adam right up the way. And uh, then we've got Chris. He is our technical... Um, guy, he, is, he also started hardware, he works for Interject Data Systems uh, up in Salmon Creek, he also works with uh, HP systems, that sort of thing. So uh, he is our programmer and he is the one that's going to be asking the technical, technical side because, you know, recruiting, HR, and tech kind of overlap, but I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. I'm going to be just as blind as the interviewee. So, with that said, we're going to get started. So, uh, if you could cell phones off or on silent, um, we are going to try to make this as real as possible. So, thank you and enjoy. Thanks for coming, Adam. All right. 
so Washington State University. Why did you choose Washington State University, Vancouver? Um, so I have a group of friends uh, locally that uh, went to WCB and told me about the program um, and all had kind of glowing reviews. So uh, obviously I also work locally as well and have a family. So relocation wasn't, wasn't a easy option for me. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the easy choice. Okay. Um, just kind of diving right into, you work at Davis Systems Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about what you do. It looks like uh, it's not so much in the programming world. It looks like you've done a lot of IT systems, engineering, a lot of the hardware side. Why are you looking at transitioning into development? So I've always kind of had an interest in development. Um, originally, my plan was to kind of pursue that, um, but I got started through tech support, um, and the opportunities to grow within tech support just kept appearing, um, and so I kept pursuing that goal. Um, but I kind of reached a point where uh, there wasn't, I had reached my limit in interest in the field of uh, management and IT management, um, and so I decided it was time to kind of make the dive into uh, getting my education and pursuing software engineering. Perfect, thank you. Okay, you done with your actual question? <laughs> for that, for that one, yeah, so. for now. <clears throat> All right, uh, so I'm gonna ask you just kind of a different series of technical questions. Some of them are, uh, we'll write some code, <coughs> some of them you can answer, uh, some of them uh, just with your voice, sure. to me, uh, speak to me. Uh, other ones you might want to diagram out, feel free to do whatever is comfortable to get to the answer. Okay. Sound good? All right, so the first one I'm going to ask is more based around uh, like algorithms and trying to uh, decide uh, the most effective way to come to the conclusion. Uh, you are provided with a large quantity of basketballs and told that a single defective basketball has been dropped into a quality group of basketballs. There's not enough time to weigh all of them individually, and time is important. What algorithmic behavior would you use to quickly find the defective basketball? using the, uh, the scale, you're providing the scale as least quantity of times as possible. So we're given a, a set of basketballs, mm -hmm. and there's one basketball that's deflated within the set. Let's say a little bit heavier than the rest, yeah, defective. So one way that you could approach this is you could take the set of basketballs, break them into two parts, okay. and weigh each individual part and each half that you weigh, the one with the defective basketball will be lighter. Um, so that would take uh, roughly log in, it would kind of be like a binary search okay. until you found the deflated basketball. Okay. Uh, another quick one, uh, this is more to uh, explain to me that you know, uh, let's say problems in software. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain what a race condition is? Um, race conditioning can occur um, with when you have multiple threaded applications that are competing for a resource. Um, in terms of, I think, when I think of race conditions, I think of um, not necessarily deadlocking, um, but there is a, uh, if you have multi-threaded applications that are reaching the same variable, um, they could be overriding one another. Um, for example, uh, if you had a banking application and somebody was withdrawing amounts and depositing, depending on the timing of how they're occurring, it could be that that uh, value that they're pulling from isn't accurate anymore. Okay. So and actually, I'm gonna go off of that question because you said something that I, uh, I did like. Uh, Describe the difference between creating a new thread and creating a new process. So a thread is a, unless it's a kernel thread, is a little abstracted to the CPU. Um, instead of creating a new actual process ID, it occurs at the, within the actual program itself. Um, so threads are, uh, from a CPU perspective, the threads are, it views it as a single process. It doesn't know the, the scheduling that's happening uh, within the, the program itself. Um, whereas with a multi, uh, if you fork or have a s separate process, the CPU is the one that's kind of uh, understanding that there's two processes in the CPU scheduler 
is determining what's getting processed. Okay. What is the benefit of one versus the other? Um, I would say with a threaded application, it's easier for a programmer to have more control over it. <coughs> um, and I know uh, with some languages, threading can get a little weird in terms of shared locks. Um, and they may not have the same uh, performance benefits uh, that you have with a multi-process um, setup. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about, <coughs> uh, as we spoke on the phone, you said that you build, uh, develop some apps on your own, some games, some different things. Can you tell us what you've done, what languages you use for those apps, and why you decided to do what you did? Um, so, most of the program development that I've done um, has been academic. Um, so, I've done programs in Python, Java. Um, one of the more interesting ones uh, that I did was a group project. Um, and it was through for a web data course. Um, and the reason it was interesting is it kind of took a collection of different technologies um, and everyone kind of had their own core components. Um, for, for that project, my responsibility was to uh, source data, uh, build a database, and then uh, my group mates would build a front end that we would then search over. Um, so the, the big picture of this project was we built a web app that you could search for movies uh, in a Netflix looking like environment. Um, so uh, what I did is I found an open source API called OMDB um, and I wrote a Python program that would uh, essentially collect movie data uh, from that API. Uh, the problem is what I didn't realize originally, uh, you have to request based on IMDB's ID uh, and there's no way to know what those IDs are. Um, so what I uh, eventually found was a resource on IMDB's website. They'll do a big data dump of just IDs. Um, and so uh, I, I chose Python because Python is a very, uh, I like Python for kind of simpler scripting. You can get a lot of stuff done with a pretty simple program. Um, and my Python program would go onto the web, pull this file of IDs, and then as it scanned through the file, it would do an API call for every movie ended up taking forever because there was 58,000 movies, but we ended up with this really large movie database um, that we could search over. Um, and it also included images too, uh, Amazon AWS URLs. Um, so we had a nice visual display. Um, but yeah, that was a cool project because everyone kind of had their own kind of technology that they were focused on and we had to kind of intertwine. Uh, so these, these may be a little bit simple for you, uh, considering looking at your experience here, but uh, I was hoping that you could please just display a simple select statement pulling columns just one, two, and three from a table named B. Uh, is Microsoft SQL and SQL okay? That's fine. throw a curveball at you here because uh -huh. we talked about which languages, but uh, you, you mentioned Python. Uh, I would like to see if you can remember in Python how to connect to a database, um, or please describe how you would connect to a database and run the select statement that you wrote there. Um, so I actually, when I, so for that project, the database that we built was actually through a CSV file. Um, so I haven't done any direct SQL um, connection through a Python script. Okay. Um, I have, I, I don't remember the syntax, but I have done it in C Sharp. And so my assumption is that most likely you would uh, import, sorry, this is very pseudo Cody. That's fine. Uh, import some kind of SQL library. Yeah. Um, and then you build some kind of, uh, you'd have a, uh, a uh, some kind of connection string. Um, so you'd have your server equal to, Something, probably a port as well, depending on how you're authenticating. Um, 
And then uh, you'd have a script as well. And you'd write this script up here. you put into the string. And then there would probably be some kind of library execution where it would actually take your, your server, your port, uh, potentially a database too. Um, and then based on the script value that you passed to it, it's probably query.execute or okay. something of that nature. Um, and then it would return the result. Okay, great. And then uh, just one more on the database side real quick. Uh, please explain to <coughs> and diagram out what an inner join is, what a left join is, and what a cross join is. And sure. I can get those two again. Okay. I did not realize how small this array was. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, if a Venn diagram is okay. That's great. Say we have table A and B. An inner join would be the intersection between the two data sets. Okay. So you choose some kind of key. And, and the shared key would be how you join the two data sets. And then uh, an inner join would be the, the rows that appear in full code where the key exists in full. Um, left join would be similar to that depending on what you're indicating as your left. Um, but it would include all of your left table as well as the inner join. Um, a right join would be similarly the opposite. Um, and then you could also choose where something, uh, you could set where A or B is null to exclude inner join if you want, just the unique values. Um, and cross join, trying to think for cross join. In MS SQL, I'm, I'm not sure I've actually used a cross join. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, and we had a database course, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a cross join in my head, but I, I can't seem to, to think what a cross join would look like in SQL. Okay. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, one question on this side. So, <coughs> getting ready to graduate, what puts you ahead of anybody else? Why, if I'm looking at <coughs> growing this team, and I'm looking at w a one to three year developer versus somebody coming out of college right now? Mm -hmm. um, you have a tech background, but brand new, essentially, to the development side. Mm -hmm. Why do I choose you? So, I think that uh, I have a unique perspective in that I have experience with account management, project management, interfacing with a lot of different teams and business development. Um, and so much of software development is collaborative effort and working with people. Uh, the coding can sometimes come secondary to <laughs> designing your requirements, your design, and working with lots of people and being able to work well with lots of people. Um, and so I, I feel like I have a strength in that area, um, and so I, I would kind of bring a lot of experience that is not necessarily going to come with a lot of other students, um, but it's something that's kind of learned over time with collaborating with people. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see, which one do I want to give you next? <laughs> Uh, so you don't have to write anything out, just in your own words. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple <coughs> different types of data structures, okay. and I'd like for you to kind of describe them to me uh, as best you can. Sure. Uh, so the first one I'd like to know about is a uh, graph data structure. So a graph is kind of similar uh, to a tree, but it's not branching. So essentially it's a collection of nodes um, that aren't necessarily, uh, uh, that don't necessarily connect back to each other. Um, is it okay if I write yeah. on it? Or yeah, okay. go for it. So it would look something, it could look something kind of like this. Um, where there's interjoining pointers that connect to each other. Okay. Um, but each individual object is kind of like a node. Okay. And at that same point, can you describe a tree to me? Sure. So a tree is a little more orderly. So you'll start with a, a root node, um, and then you'll have a series of branches, and then eventually you'll have what, what are called kind of leaf nodes, which point to null, um, which are the bottom of your tree. Um, in terms
terms of data ordering, if it's a binary search tree, uh, the data is ordered in the fact that everything to the left is smaller than everything to the right, okay. um, which can be useful for some things. How about the uh, array? Uh, so an array is kind of a sequential block of elements. benefit being that because it stored sequentially, you can use your indices to determine where certain values are. Um, okay. And to branch off of that one, a linked list. So a linked list is similar to a graph in that it's a collection of nodes. Uh, typically you'll have a, a head node that connects to and then the final one will point to null. Um, the nice thing about this is you can do interesting things in terms of uh, deletion and ordering. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could uh, take this first node and point to the last one to essentially delete the middle one, um, which is not something that you can easily do in an array where you end up having to move everything over and it takes a lot more time. Okay. Let's stack. Uh, so a stack is, so the way to think of a stack, <laughs> how would you describe a stack? So a stack is a uh, last in, first out data structure. And you can think of it as kind of, well, some people refer to it as like a stack of plates, where you, you constantly put data in, and then whenever you remove something from it, you remove the last thing that was put in. So if you had like a five, three, four, one as an input, and you put it in sequentially, to remove or pop something from the stack, you would remove the one first and then the which can be nice if you're for a lot of things, but uh, one thing to think about is reverse order of things. Put everything in the stack and then pop it out, you'll get the exact reverse order. Okay. And then how about a hash table? So a hash table is a data structure that's useful for quick lookup. Um, and usually the way that it works is, so if we're given an input, you will use the input as essentially an indice uh, to point to a value. Um, so if you're trying to uh, look up something in constant time, because you're using the actual element itself as the uh, lookup value, you can quickly look up the, the value you're looking for. Okay. Job would be like a hash, hash map, hash set, or kind of similar. Where do you see the uh, pretty standard, uh, where do you see yourself question? But I don't like to look at a five year plan when it comes to careers. I want to look at where do you see yourself a year from now? Um, you know, getting ready to get into the first career, first job in development. Um, you've got, you know, backgrounds in, in different things. So where do you see yourself realistically one year from now and three years? Um, so in one year, I see myself as a software engineer, um, and really after that, uh, I'd say in three years, I just want to be building up experience. Um, I know sometimes, depending on the company, some companies you'll be at more of like a tier two or a senior uh, after a couple years, but uh, realistically, that's kind of secondary to the fact that I just want to gain that actual real work experience, <laughs> working as a software engineer at that point. And if you had to pick three different languages to concentrate on <laughs> and only concentrate on those three, mm -hmm. what would be your top three and why? Mm. So I feel like uh, Python is a language that uh, has a lot of use. Um, and I feel like in terms of industry, uh, it's used pretty widely um, for a lot of different I think I'm actually interested in stuff I haven't used before. Um, so I haven't done a lot of front end. Um, so I really want to actually get into JavaScript um, and do some more of that. So that's an area that I, I haven't had much experience <coughs> in. Um, and also, um, I know Go is becoming 
uh, really popular and a lot of people used to go. So um, I'm probably actually more interested in, in languages I haven't used before. Um, and to gain that experience as well. Okay, thanks. All right, so the next two are going to be more focused around uh, actually writing a program. So the first one is just going to be more conceptual. What object-oriented classes would you create in order to make a chess program? Ooh, a chess program. So uh, disclosure, I actually don't know a lot of chess uh, in terms of the rules. Uh, but abstractly, so I would, for a chess program, uh, say in like Java, uh, I would create a, a game board class that essentially has a data structure probably a two-dimensional array that has each kind of, uh, each individual grid uh, of the game. Um, and then it would store the state of that grid um, in terms of what's being played. Um, then I'd also have likely some kind of view uh, in the window builder or whatever the actual user input buttons, things like that. Um, and then in terms of the controller, I would have, uh, you know, based on the user input, I would send back and manipulate the uh, model and the story the grid um, and game logic. Okay. Kind of a model view controller, kind of basic. Okay. And <coughs> I'll make this my last one for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, uh, do you understand Fibonacci sequence and how that runs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, could you write me a program to print out the nth value of the Fibonacci sequence? Sure. So, just to confirm my match with the Fibonacci sequence. So, the Fibonacci sequence is it takes the last two values and the nth value is essentially the sum of the two before it. Right. So it's okay. zero, one, one, two, three, and so on. Five, eight. Okay. Um, and this would be uh, the input would just be a single integer. Correct. Okay. So thinking of how to solve this, I know a Fibonacci or a recursive solution could probably grow very large. A recursive stack could, uh, which for the runtime would be great. Um, I think we can probably solve this iteratively um, by essentially tracking the last two Fibonacci occurrences. Um, and so I think we could get time complexity to linear time dependent on the input. Um, so if we had two pointers looking at the last two values, we could return based on if it was less than, so can I assume if it's Fibonacci uh, uh, two, is it this, does it count to zero? If it does count to zero. Okay, yep. so Fib Fibonacci two would be one. Correct. Okay. Um, it's okay if I write this in Java. You can write any language you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we're returning it.
two to n. Um, and it's simply going to take the value going to set the last pointer equal to um, what's last and then last so essentially the way this would work is we start to we would set our last value here set right here and then finally it would return prep, which should be the value. So I'll, I'll kind of walk through it too to make sure. <laughs> so let's just put down here. Okay. So for six. I probably could have got away with one less pointer than that, but. <laughs> Thank you. Like I said, I would let that be, I'll let my, that be my last one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that said.